your moderator for this class. Welcome to the Madison, Wisconsin branch school. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. We hold classes in United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Madison branch was established in 1987. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord, the true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is a title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus or Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our father and his son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a superincorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses to top Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function 
of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First up, you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to know, make known that, yeah, to know that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua, the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua, the Messiah, with the hope of mortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace. And our slogan is speak the truth. Our scripture reading tonight will be Matthew, the 25th chapter. If that could please be read by Dr. Delilah Tucker from the Madison, Wisconsin branch school. And if we could start with a prayer by Dr. Rick Ensenroth, also of the Madison, Wisconsin school. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank our Heavenly Father Yahweh for bringing us into the fold, if you will. Thank him for giving us the strength to resist, knowing that it's him doing it for us. Thank him for his love, his mercy. Thank him for being and letting us know that there's much more out there than what we used to believe. In Yahshua's name, let us all say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, class. I'll be reading Matthew, the 25th chapter, starting at 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Master, Master, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several, several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same, 
and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and dig in the earth and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Master, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His master said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been fruitful over the few thing, over a few things. I will make thee make thee rulers over many things. Enter thou into the joy of my mat of thy master. He also that received two talents came and said, Master, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I gain, have I have gained two other talents besides them. His master said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy master. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Master, I know thee that thou art a, a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His master answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not straw. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money in the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath, that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And behold, him shall he gather all nations. Him shall be, wait, behold, oh, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on, his, on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty. And he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Master, we when saw we thee a hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in? or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee, thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of them, these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall ye say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and, and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Master, 
When saw we thee a hunger or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Thank you. Our readers this evening will please be Dr. Karen Gagno of the Madison, Wisconsin School, Dr. Gail Josephson of the Green Bay, Wisconsin School, and Dr. Kelly Gagno, also of the Madison, Wisconsin School. Welcome everyone that has come out to study with us tonight. We're glad to have you here. Good to see so many visiting brethren. We do have a returning visitor, Tatiana, glad to have you back. And also a warm welcome to anyone that is joining us on YouTube tonight. We will have a three speaker format this evening with each speaker having approximately 35 minutes. And just a reminder to please stay muted unless you are a speaker, a reader, or helping call a scripture. That would be appreciated, thank you. And with that, our first speaker will please be Dr. David Klopach of the Madison, Wisconsin School. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good to be with you. Um, well, with all of our visitors, I didn't think I would get called again. I could get, uh, get away with this here. Let me see. <laughs> um, let's, uh, let's start with the scripture reading again. So before I have you read it, um, you know, this is... <clears throat> In the beginning of this, it's the parable of the 10 virgins. Um, you know, and I sum, sum, summarize it as saying, well, um, <clears throat> be prepared. Uh, well, what does that mean? Well, um, you can't wait until, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to wait to learn about God when I'm old when I'm ready to die, right? <laughs> because how does, how do you know when you're going to die, right? This is, you got to be prepared, meaning um, know your creator now because you don't know when, uh, if you tarry too long or you're not prepared, kind of like the whole, like, you know, I'm in the business of uh, helping clients save for retirement. It's the same kind of thing, you know, if you, if you never did anything your whole life, then you get to be old and you like never saved anything your whole life, get to be old and then you like want to retire and you're like, oh crap, I didn't think about that. I wasn't really prepared. So then it doesn't work. Um, and that's just another example of, you don't have to have money to prepare for this retirement. This retirement is an everlasting retirement. All you, you don't need to work, you don't need to work hard on this. You just have to know Yahweh. Um, and if that seems like a tough task, well, then all you got to do is ask Yasha to help, you know, him, and then that'll be accomplished. Um, and then the parable of the talents, um, was starting at 14, you know, we've all, well, most of us, I think have learned or heard this before, but, um, so talents, uh, that's just money, you know, so, um, he gave, uh, here, let's start at 14. Matthew 25, 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one, he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To yeah, every okay. Oh, yep, yeah, go ahead. Continue with that until it's done there. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Yeah, so um, he gave the one five talents, another two, and another one one. So, you know, the guy with the five, let's call him five dollars, just so because we think of currency like that. Um, so he went out and he doubled his money, right? Um, I think he got another five. 
hundred percent return. Amazing. Um, the other <laughs> one he gave too. Didn't he double his money too? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Doubled his money a hundred percent again. This is just insanity. Um, <laughs> and then the other one, if he would have known that you could take that and double your money, why wouldn't he do it? No, instead he, he didn't want to do that and he buried it. Um, but is, you know, is Yashua really talking about, um, you know, take your money and double it? You know, that's l- later on here. Um, if you go to just quickly go to 27. Sure. 25 and 27. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming, I should have received mine, mine own with usury. Yeah, if that doesn't make sense to you, usury is an interest rate. So mm-hmm. that's how they're able to, you know, receive more money for their money. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, th- this was, uh, <clears throat> this is kind of a funny thing. I, I had some, uh, meetings with Muslim clients when I first started in my business, my line of work. And, but they, uh, it must be, I, I don't know exactly where it comes from, but they're in, but they're not able to collect an interest rate. We had to, they had to do somehow we could get around it with a dividend, but they couldn't get an interest rate on an account. Um, it's kind of funny. <laughs> then you see it there. It just popped into my mind. Um, so anyways, um, it, it's not about just taking your money and doubling. That's not what Yashua was talking about. That's not the point here. Um, the point is, is that we've been given from Yashua, um, telling Dr. Kinley, giving him a vision and a revelation to show us this teaching, right? Now we've been given an understanding of this teaching. And if we take this understanding that we have, and we don't share it by doing things like this classes. And when I'm called upon, whether I'm tired or not, I should at least tell you a few things I know. Because if I don't, what am I doing? I'm taking my money and I'm burying it in the ground. And that's more or less our, our responsibility. We're like, um, you know, we're prisoners. Uh, give give. Can you give me where Paul said that uh, so people don't think I'm crazy when I say we're prisoners? Uh, do you know where that is? Isn't that Paul that said we're pri- I'm a prisoner? All right, I can find it. Um, one second, three and one. Three and one, yeah, yep. Ephesians 3 and 1. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Yahshua the Messiah, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of Yahweh, which is given me toward you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. Whereby. Oh, oh, go ahead. Can finish it out, please. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Yahshua. Um, and, and that's, you, you know, through the revelations we're giving, which are revela- we're, we're given, which is a revelation, which is an understanding about the purpose and plan that Yahweh has through Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua. Understanding that having that revelation makes us a prisoner or a servant or of this, of Yahshua, this teaching. Um, And if we take that knowledge and we take that revelation that we have and we bury it for whatever reason, if you're embarrassed of it, or I don't know, um, you're taking that, you're the guy with the one, you know, one coin, one dollar, and and burying it. You're not you're not in, doing any increases. And throughout this book, this this Bible here, um, 
it's always about it's always been about the increase of spirit because if you ask yourself well, why in the heck did a all powerful god which is yahweh why did he do any of this what's the point well the point is save souls and have an increase okay it's not like Yahweh came in, did this. So go if you could go to the dispensations, ages and dispensations chart real quick, just for a visual aid. Thank you. So this is dispens dispensations and ages chart. Um, it's not like Yahweh went in, made the angelic creation, and then takes us all out um, at the end at the end of the age here, the earthly age, the kingdom of age. And then there's the same substance from the beginning at the end, you know, and that's it. No, it's always about an increase. That's what we've been taught throughout all the, this, those book is about the increase. And that's what we've seen for if, when we look at Romans 119 and 20 about the, um, the physical reveals the spiritual everything we see is about an increase right what do you do um throughout our lives it's about an increase you have kids you increase you have a you if you grow a garden you don't want to plant one tomato seed and get one tomato seed no <laughs> you want to plant a tomato seed and get a whole bunch of tomatoes and you can take those seeds out of those tomatoes and then plant new seed new tomato plants with those it's always an increase uh, if i plant one apple tree i don't want one apple i want a bunch of apples you know it, it, and it goes on and on and on if and if you say well dave you're just talking about farming no it's guess what we need that to live and if we want to live uh in eternal life um again this is just physical reveal and spiritual we need an increase um and that's an increase of knowledge about yashua and his purpose and plan um so you know when i when i you read through these you know chapter 25 and the parable about the talents i guess that's uh, that's where you know my mind goes is that this is the revelation that we we can't hide and we can't stick away we have to have this increase and how do we increase it well by hopefully telling people about what ha what we talk about here and it's hard to get, you know, people interested, but that's not our jobs. All we can do is tell people what we know. And it's Yahshua's job to open up their uh, eyes and understanding. Um, <clears throat> what else? Um, uh, I don't know where to go from there. Um, I'm not prepared to work with the increase, but maybe someone else is uh, going down through the lines and doing that. Um, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there. Sorry, I didn't take all my time, but uh, um, I'm just not prepared to go through all that, and I don't want to chug it along. So thanks everyone for um, the time to speak and praise Yashua. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will please be Dr. Gail Josephson of the Green Bay, Wisconsin Branch School. Uh, hello, everybody. Good um, evening. <laughs> I really enjoyed what um, David had to say. That was um, very interesting. Um, yeah, there is a lot to um, work with with the scripture. And, um, you know, and uh, the, the first two sections of Matthew 25, um, the first part is um, my headings are the parable of the 10 virgins. And the next one is the parable of the talents. And both of them are stories or parables that are um, talking about um, the kingdom of heaven. And that was Yahshua's um, mission that um, he was 
going to teach the people about the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, when you go to church, that's what you want to learn about. Everybody wants to be part of the kingdom of heaven. Um, so let's pick it up at one, please. And um, I'll just work with a few points in this section here. Matthew 25 and 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Okay, so here is um, just showing the difference between um, people. Like David had said that, um, you know, the idea is to be prepared. And um, we are in this creation now to learn of Yahweh and our first aim is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists and um, we want to we want to know something about Yahweh um, so you, first of all um, I had to come down here just as you did not knowing anything um, factual about our creator um, we don't know anything until we've had somebody teach us. We had to have a preacher and um, we've had that. We have that in the school, but Dr. Kinley came in to teach the world in these latter days. And he had a vision and a revelation right from Yahweh, as did Moses um, back at the time of the children of Israel in the wilderness. He had a vision. He had a vision before that, actually, at the burning bush. And um, so we have to have a preacher, a true preacher, because you can turn on the TV and find all sorts of false doctrine. Um, people preaching, they say the kingdom of God or here's the word of God. And all they really are, what they're really doing is asking for money. They want to support their own selves. Um, and we don't have any paid ministers down here. So we can, we tell you the truth. They have to tell you what they think you want them, what they, what you think they want to hear. Okay. Because if you tell them something they don't want to hear, they're not going to watch the program next Sunday and they're not going to send in their money. Okay. But we can tell you the truth and um, we're not, because we're not relying on your money. So we want to teach you um, information that we have learned about Yahweh and his son, Yahshua, whom he sent. Okay, so the kingdom of heaven is likened unto the 10 virgins and they had their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And um, five were foolish and five were wise. And I just want to get, I think in Proverbs, the first chapter talks about foolishness, I think. Let's just look at that and see if. One and seven. Okay, thank you. Proverbs one and seven. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay. So let's just work with the fools first um, on here, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So these 10 virgins, they went out to meet the bridegroom and um, they despise the wisdom of taking oil and they despise the instruction. Um, I'm sure they were told they had to bring the oil. Okay, so they despise the the wisdom of having oil for their lamps. You don't go out someplace at night and not have some sort of light with you. Okay, so fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now we want to have wisdom and we want to have instruction. Um, so, um, and the first part of this verse is the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. And in my margin, um, this meaning of the word fear means reverence or it would be awe. So our awe of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. When we're in awe of something, don't, don't you wanna learn more or to see more, um, to talk about it? And that 
brings us on to knowledge. We want to learn more of him. So let's get um, John 17 and 1, please. So the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. I'm reading um, Proverbs while you're looking for the other scripture. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. John 17 and 1. Okay. These words spake Yahshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As mm -hmm. thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Okay, so we are <laughs> the people that want to have eternal life. And um, we are seeking Yahweh in spirit and in truth, as it says earlier in um, the book of John. So he's going to give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him um, from Yahweh. So looking at this chart, at the bottom of the chart is the, um, um, the e Egypt is down in the black portion. And Yahweh has only given the children of Israel um, uh, knowledge and instruction so that they can flee the Egyptians and they can get out of bondage. So they, uh, they were the wise ones, okay? Because Pharaoh and his host, they didn't have the instructions to um, kill a lamb in the evening and put the blood around the door and eat the Passover supper and they would be saved from the death angel. So the children of Israel had the wisdom and instruction and the other ones um, didn't, they were foolish. Um, and, but Yahweh made them that way, as David had said a little bit, you know, there's, um, he has only called um, the ones he has chosen, okay? So having, a, actually it's a pattern of salvation they knew what to do and they celebrated Passover as it talks about in the 12th chapter of Exodus. And they were um, freed from captivity of the Egyptians. And they went through the Red Sea and into the wilderness where they could worship Yahweh. So they had, um, here's an example of being wise and to um, have salvation. So anyway, back in, um, Matthew, the 25th chapter, it says that the, the foolish, um, uh, let's read that again, Karen, I'm sorry, in 25 and 1 and 2. Uh, Matthew 25 and 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Okay, so they had their lamps, but they didn't take their oil, so they were foolish. All right, go ahead. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Okay, so they had their um, little lamps and they had oil. I don't know if they were little, actually. They, in their vessels, um, were their lamps and they had oil in it. <laughs> Okay, so um, verse five. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at okay. midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Okay. Um, I just want to... Oh, sorry. Just hang on, I'm sorry. Um, you know, Yahweh talks about the bridegroom and it's actually a special occasion in Psalms, the 19th chapter, and I know Rick had gotten this a couple of weeks ago or last week even um, about the bridegroom. So um, could we just read in 19 and one also in Psalms and hang on to Matthew because I'm gonna go back to that. Psalms 19 and one. Mm -hmm. The heavens declare the glory of Yahweh and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Okay, so here we are back with the knowledge. 
and uh, we can see the glory of Yahweh by looking at the creation, just like in Romans 1, 19 and 20. Uh, for the invisible things of Yahweh um, can be clearly seen by looking at the things that are made. So the heavens are made and they declare the glory of Yahweh and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Don't we look at the sky in the morning at sunrise and at sunset and at, um, you know, you can see the blue and the purple um, and the scarlet that, you know, from this earth plane, you, there's a blue, purple and scarlet veil um, separating us in the heavens and the firmament. All right, just like in that tabernacle, there were blue, purple, and scarlet veils that separated the different compartments in the tabernacle. And you had to cross a veil if you wanted to get through to the next level or um, next area in that tabernacle. Okay, and there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So everybody has a chance to hear about Yahweh. Um, you can hear the creation speaking, and you can see um, the glory of Yahweh. And their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So they have a, a line or a train of thought and the words of Yahweh go until the ends of the world. And we've kind of been talking about different religions. Um, actually, when um, David had said about the um, Muslims that he had as clients. We talked about the um, Islamic religion last night, and they have the Bible. They know the Bible, and um, they. Um, yesterday, the speaker was talking about. You can watch it on YouTube. That he was talking, and he quoted from the Quran. He read it. Well, he said where he was reading from. I read it the some of it this morning, and they were quoting what had happened in the Bible, but they had commentaries at the bottom of the page and they weren't sure that that really happened well we can show you that Yahshua died for our sins by looking at the creation and um by uh, number four and their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world okay continue on please from there where I just finished it's a sentence in five, but it starts in them. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, <laughs> which as is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Mm -hmm. And read the next verse. Please. His, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Right. So in them, in his words and in his knowledge and speech, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. So the bridegroom is excited about um, being a, a, bri a bridegroom and um, to be married. OK, and he has a lot of energy he re and he's rejoicing as a strong man to run a race. And um, that's what these virgins were waiting for, um, to see the bridegroom and to help celebrate, to share in his joy. Well, going back into Matthew, the 25th um, chapter, the foolish ones ran out of oil during the night. So, uh, uh, that dampered their um, chances of meeting the bridegroom. Okay, so um, pick it up where it said, um, well, I think we left off at five and six. Yeah. Okay. Five. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And mm -hmm. that night there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Okay, so there was a cry made that somebody had spotted the bridegroom and um, they were supposed to go out and meet him. All right, go ahead. Seven, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Mm -hmm. Foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. Mm -hmm. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. 
Right. So uh, now the the foolish virgins, they ran out of their oil and they asked the wise virgins for some of their oil. But the wise ones were wise and they knew that that wouldn't work, that they didn't have enough oil for both. And when we come into this teaching, we have to stand up on our own two feet. We have to be like David had said, we have to be prepared for the end, just like he's selling um, retirement plans or um, the know-how to have a retirement plan. And um, he's preparing people for their comfort in their old age or in, in the next life after they retire. And um, what we're looking forward to is uh, the retirement plan after this um, stay on earth. Okay. And the, that retirement plan has great benefits and we will be taken care of. And um, just to go along with the retirement theme here, but um, the wise virgins were saying, no, we can't give you oil because um, we might not have enough for ourselves. And they were wise in saying that because um, they, uh, it would be dumb for them to run out of oil for themselves and to lose their eternal life. Now the um, oil in the tabernacle is a symbol of the um, Holy Spirit. Can you just zoom in a little bit or a lot on that? tabernacle in the wilderness or any of the tabernacles that you have in a church yeah perfect okay so do you see where it says court roundabout and it's in um, the tabernacle and you have the um, altar of burnt offering and you can see the flames there there's a grading system and it's an altar and they would sacrifice a lamb and it would be burned and nothing would be consumed. Now, just above that would be the labor of water and they would have to wash the sacrifice um, before they would put it on that altar. And that's a symbol of water or the principle of water. Let me put it that way. And the first part is um, death and um, in, yep, on the altar. And then there is, would be a burial in that court roundabout. And also the priests had to cleanse themselves there. Now, yep, now where you have the pointer with priest, that's the low priest. And he is ministering and making the sacrifices for the people. And above his head is a horn of holy anointing oil. So the oil is a symbol, is the principle of having um, the Holy Spirit because that priest had to perform flawlessly in that tabernacle. He couldn't make any mistakes. And some people, a couple people made a mistake, um, maybe intentionally, foolishly, let's put it that way. Um, and they were killed in that tabernacle and they were priests, okay? So that holy anointing oil would show that we have to have the spirit of Yahweh in us. Um, why don't we get the scripture about that, about the, um, you, uh, let's see, about the brethren and how the oil goes down the garments of the priests, because we don't talk about the oil very often. <clears throat> or I haven't heard it. I haven't thought about it for a while, I should say. I'll put it on me. Try Leviticus 21 and 10. Yes, Leviticus 21 and 10. Okay. And he that is the high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head nor rend his clothes. Neither shall he go in to any dead body nor defile himself for his father or his mother. Okay, so in 10, and he that is the high priest among his brethren upon whose head the anointing oil was poured and that made him consecrated. Okay, and consecrated means to um, sanctify or to make holy. 
and and then he would put on the garments okay and shall not uncover his head nor rent his clothes so they had to be pretty pretty careful in that tabernacle um that they and, and that they had to wear the garments as specified and on their head they had to wear um a bonnet and on that bonnet they had underneath that would be a um on their forehead they had to have a there, it was a golden plate and it was engraved um with the words holiness unto yahweh and it was tied around their head um with uh, blue lace okay so it was tied tight so that it would be on their forehead and would slip off and they had to wear their hat but um, if you think about it, there would, when you take that um, signet, I guess it is called, when you take that off, it's imprinted in their forehead in, you know, like the lines on your forehead, it would be, it would still be there, you know, like how um, if you lay funny at night and you have a little crease in your forehead, well, that would be um, it would say right on them, holiness unto Yahweh. Okay, so they were made holy by that holy anointing oil that they had to pour. And uh, I think I want also, I think that there's another scripture about the oil on the high priest and it goes down on them. So let me see if I can find it. Um, 133 and 2 maybe in Psalms, or is it Isaiah? Let's see, Psalms 133 and 2, if that's it. Yeah. Can Michael Psalm read it? Psalm 133 oh. and 2. Yeah, thank you. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Okay, pick it up at one, please. Psalms 30, 133 and one. Mm -hmm. A song of degrees of David. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Okay, so this is a, a, a wise thing to do is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Now you have other religions and they just can't agree on anything um amongst themselves but here we do dwell in unity and that um when we go to a lecture on any place on from any class on zoom um held by this class that we all say the same thing and we all are preaching the truth about Yahweh. We teach the death, the burial and the labor and the resurrection with that holy anointing oil. There's a, we preach by death, burial and resurrection. That doesn't change. So how good it is and pleasant for the brethren to dwell together in unity. Okay, continue on. It is like the precious ointment upon the head mm -hmm. that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Right, so now he's talking about what we just read in Leviticus, that it was Aaron that had to have that uh, holy anointing oil on him, which is as the um, Holy Spirit is poured out on us. Okay, and um, for us to dwell together in unity, that we preach the gospel the way it really is, um, it is like the precious ointment upon the head. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, it just runs down, it completely covers that high priest. Now we have to have that oil or the Holy Spirit right within us. And let me just get that in the New Testament and um, that Yahweh will dwell, that Yeshua will just dwell within us. Um, let's see, I wanna get in Colossians 1 and 26. Colossians 1 and 26. Mm -hmm. Did you want to pick it up at all, Gail? Um, no, there are in, in 27, I won also. Okay, starting at 26. Uh -huh. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his sons. Okay, so there's that knowledge again, that 
it was, it's a mystery. This gospel is a mystery uh, to everybody, unless they have the preacher that comes from Yahweh. Um, it's a mystery and it's hid from ages and generations, but is now made manifest or it's made known unto his sons. And that's why we can dwell together in unity, like the precious oil. Okay, keep going. To whom Yahweh would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Okay, so now he's including us. Does back there in Leviticus and in Psalms where it talks about that oil, that was for the Jews and the Jews only. It wasn't for us. But now he's made it known unto the Gentiles. And um, that's who we are. We're the Gentiles, unless you're a physical Jew, which, you know, I'm, that there are um, physical Jews. But you know what? They miss the time of his visitation and that he... Um, he he's bringing he's making them spiritual Jews and he's making himself known unto the Gentiles. OK, it's not going to be a mystery anymore. All right, go ahead. To whom Yahweh would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Yahshua in you, the hope of glory. OK, so it's Yahshua in you. So he is like that precious ointment. And it's going to be Yahshua in us. And that Yahshua is the Holy Spirit. Um, can you go to the names chart, please? I think it, that might be a, a good way to explain it. Yep. Okay, so at the top you have Yahweh. And he's the father. Um, and um, But people... Um, don't say it correctly. Uh, they, they call him Jehovah or the Lord or, um, yeah, down there. Okay. His name is Yahweh. Then if you go to the right and Elohim is in purple and, and that's the word or son. Okay. And then the Holy spirit is Yahshua. Yahshua's name. Yahshua is the name of the Holy spirit. Okay. So that is the Holy Spirit in you that they're talking about in here in Colossians, which is Yahshua in you, the hope of glory. Okay. And that is um, like that holy anointing oil. Okay. And Yahshua is going to quicken us. Um, did we get that today? Did David get that? For, um, Ephesians 2 and 1. I was listening to YouTube and they might have quoted it there. I want to get that Ephesians 2 and 1. Ephesians 2 and 1. Mm -hmm. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Right. So he made that change in us. He's the one that caused those virgins to have the correct amount of oil in their lamps. Okay. And um, it's nothing really that we can do or nothing they can could do themselves he is the one that he, he's going to quicken us and we were dead in trespasses and sins and um skip down to um verse eight in that same chapter verse eight ephesians mm -hmm. two and eight for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of yahweh right so by grace are we saved and Yahshua, by his grace, is um, causing us to know something about him. He's, he's causing his Holy Spirit to um, enter into us. Um, since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit now dwells in people. And um, he's made himself known unto us. So let's go back to Matthew, and I'll, I'll be done in just a, a couple minutes here also. But I want to skip down now with the oil in the lamps. Don't be one of the foolish ones. Um, okay, I see it. Now I'll be done. Um, don't be one of the foolish ones. Make sure you're one of the wise men and so that you pay attention. Come to these classes and learn all you can about Yahweh. And Dr. Kinley had said, because you're going to need it. All right. I'm sure when David counsels people about their retirement he doesn't say well just uh, just save just a little bit he's 
he probably tells them, save as much as you can because you're going to need it. All right. And there's all everything's always going to cost us more than what we think. OK. And um, these virgins with the oil, the ones that had enough, they were prepared. They had it in them um, that Yahshua caused them to bring enough oil. And now I want to go down to where it says about, um, well, then the, the foolish one said, um, we, don't, we won't have enough. Can we have some of yours? And the wise men said, no, go and buy your own. Okay. And that's in 10. So let's read 10, please. And, and, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Right. Now we want to be on the correct side of the door when the door is shut, because when the door was shut on that ark with Noah in the flood, the door was shut onto the righteous souls that were in the ark, and it was shut against the people that were wicked in their ways on the other side of the door. Okay. So the wise ones went in, they had enough oil that they went in through the door. Okay, go ahead. In Matthew 11 afterward came also the other virgin saying master master open to us okay but and I'm sure at the ark there were people pounding on the door and at, at calling Noah and say open the door you know once that rain started but I don't even know if they knew where the door was because it was pretty dark there and the ark was pitched without but I'm sure they cried and um wanted to be saved when that um earth was inundated in water okay once it first started all right mm -hmm. so he's um they say open to us all right keep going karen but he answered and said verily i say unto you i know you not mm -hmm. watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the son of man comes right so now yash was saying he doesn't know them and um they are the ones that they're not going to be saved. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So be prepared. And on the next parable, we're about the talents. Can you just read about um, verse 30? Because this is going to be the same thing as um, what's going to happen to the, the foolish virgins. 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right. So that's what's happening with the guy that um, just buried his talent, that he didn't, he didn't, didn't gain anything for his master. He didn't have any increase. And he would be cast out into outer darkness, and there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And um, that's what happened with the people on the outside of the ark, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So anyway, you know, like, um, what I had said about that we teach the true gospel, you know, we teach by blood, water, and spirit, and death, burial, and resurrection. That's how this gospel's preached. And you have to, it would be um, a great thing for you to come and learn with us and to learn how the principles of Yahweh work down um, through the dispensations and ages so that. Um, we are prepared and we will have some um, some hope of salvation and which is Yahshua in us, our only hope of glory. And thank you for your attention. Our final speaker will be Dr. Dennis Volpe from the Oceanside Club. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to make sure, first of all, I'll do a sound check. Everybody can hear me, I hope. Got you, Danny. Good. All right, great. Now, there was some great points made by uh, our first two speakers. And what I would like to do is continue with what we have in our scripture reading tonight to try to work with that a little bit further. Now... What we read in Matthew 25, 
is pretty much talking about what we're headed towards down here now at the end of the age. We are at a point where we're waiting for the universal revelation of Yahshua from heaven. And we are those brides that are talked about in the first part of Matthew, the 25th chapter. So let's go back over there and start up at 1. Matthew 25 and 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. All right, now here's the interesting thing. They're going to meet their, their, their uh, bridegroom. That's what they're going forth to do. They're expecting to come in uh, contact or uh, with their bridegroom, and they are preparing themselves. Now, we have ten of them, but five are foolish and five are wise. Keep reading. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, the question is this. Why would somebody bring their lamp and not bring oil? Because you would think the purpose of a lamp is obviously to have light to guide you. In those days, of course, they used a lantern or whatever uh, if they had to walk at night and, and, and they needed to have light to be guided. And they knew, of course, the importance of having oil to burn, to bring that light to bear. Now, this is what you're really looking at. You're looking at five souls. I'm using that analogy of the, of the five unwise that did not really believe they were going to need the oil. Otherwise, what reason would they have not to bring the oil? They did not believe they were going to need it. And that oil was the source of light for them, ladies and gentlemen. They obviously felt that they were waiting for the point where the bridegroom would appear and that they would be okay and who knows when he's coming? Who knows, you know, if we're going to see him in our lifetime? All these sorts of things. And they didn't have oil. Now the other five, they believed that they needed to have something to sustain them. Something that they could burn within their hearts that would give them light, to give them what they needed to be able to walk on down to the point where then the uh, light of the world, the light of mankind, as Yahshua said, I am the light of the world, would universally appear. Because the whole world lies in darkness, ladies and gentlemen. We live in a world where mankind is basically ignorant of Yahweh as he actually is and truthfully exists in his great purpose and plan. And the sad thing is, Many people don't care. They don't want to know. And there are those that think that nobody knows. Nobody knows if there's really a God or what's going to happen and all these kind of things. And the world acts not on oil in their lamp, but they act on their own carnal, if you will, uh, nature and desires to guide them in life. Thinking, and most people, when they go to church, and I like what David was talking about there, about, uh, you know, people think that uh, if they go to church and they so-called worship God, they believe that, you know, they're a God-fearing person because they go to church, but they don't have any knowledge, they think that's enough to sustain them or to get them through this. Now, that is foolishness. Now, in the tabernacle, that holy anointing oil was used for many purposes other than just putting it in the lampstand. Now, of course, it provided light in the holy place. When they filled the lamp, that lampstand had oil in each one of those bowls 
to show that that's what gave them light during the hours of darkness. Oil was also used to anoint the high priest. That was quoted tonight, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity, and it's like the oil that poured down over Aaron's head, which is the anointing. Now they also anointed all the vessels in the tabernacle. Everything was anointed with oil. And that is because the tabernacle, ladies and gentlemen, is a physical example, a figure of the greater and more perfect tabernacle, which is Yahweh Elohim himself. He is the archetype, original pattern of the universe that the physical one is just an example of. Within the body of Elohim, everything, every vessel, every attribute, is, has to be anointed with the Holy Spirit or with that nature, divine nature of Yahweh. And that's what powers that tabernacle and causes them to have sustenance, causes them to be cleansed, causes them to have light, and is necessary on the Day of Atonement as well. Now, what we have to do is translate this information over to practicality of what is going on with you today in this class. Now we can come to class and we can gain knowledge. We can learn all kinds of interesting facts and have more Bible trivia than you can imagine. No scriptures back and forth. But if it does not cause a effect upon your heart and in your soul and drive you and illuminate you to the consciousness that Yahweh is real, then you're walking around with no oil. Now Paul talks about this in one of his epistles. He said, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now there are those that are ever learning that never come to the knowledge of the truth. Now just because we have information that's not where it stops. Certainly we come down here to learn information about Yahweh, how he actually is, truthfully exists. We come down here to learn about how his purpose and pattern operate. But it's got to take effect down in the depths of your soul. And that's what the anointing was showing forth, is that it, they were covered in that oil, that that oil became, as it were, a balm to their physical body because it's a balm to the soul. Now keep reading where you left off there because I want to go down further into this. Okay, um, five. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Now, now listen. While the bridegroom tarried, what does that mean? It means that he didn't come right away and nobody exactly knew when he would show up, so to speak. I'll put it that way. But all of a sudden at midnight, it said at midnight. It didn't say at 12 noon. But at midnight there was a cry that the bridegroom cometh. Now, how do we apply that? Well, we're all living in this world. We're living our lives. We're trying to conduct our affairs and our business in this world. And the whole world lies in darkness. And we have to recognize that when we go to work and we're talking to our fellow workers and people that we meet on the street, that those people are walking in complete ignorance of Yahweh, how he actually is and truthfully exists. They're not conscious of him. And their world is not filled with the light of the gospel of salvation. But you are. You've been given that light. Now, the world is in a state right now, and I'll say it's at midnight. You know they have a doomsday clock. And with that clock, they show how close we are to midnight, or the 12 midnight, which they, they use that analogy to talk about the destruction of mankind. And they said that we've never been so close. I've heard this recently to hitting 
that 12 midnight point where destruction is about to occur because they see the calamity in the world, they see the polarization, and they see what's going on really in the hearts and minds of these world leaders and mankind. Now, this ought to tell you that we're close to the end. And we're crying to you in this gospel that Yahshua is about to make a universal revelation from heaven. And even though it's dark out there and it does not seem, well, how could he do that at the middle of the night? He said in Matthew 24, he said, at a time when you think not, So in other words, when you think he's going to come, and it would be nice for him to come when it was a, when everything was pleasant in the world and everything was this, that, that's not the way he set up his purpose. When Yahshua or Yahweh Elohim, in the angelic creation, had the devil and his angels cast out of, cast out of heaven, and they were cast down into the earth, and, the, and over in Revelation, the 12th chapter, what it says is that the devil is coming down with great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. Now, there's going to be a time of reckoning. Now, if you remember in one of our uh, so-called gospels that we read, that the world calls them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, Yahshua came to cast demons out of this one individual. And the demon said, we know who you are. Have you come to torment us before time? Now they know there's going to, be come, there's going to come a day of reckoning. It's also talked about in the book, I believe, of Jude. And that day of reckoning, ladies and gentlemen, is coming up quick. Because in 24th chapter of Matthew, Yahshua said this, that there will be a time of so much trouble that if it was not cut short, even the very elect would be lost or be deceived or whatever, however it goes. So he's got to cut it short. Now this world isn't going to get better, and you can hope all you want that things are going to improve in the earth plane and life is going to get better. I know we have children. I know we have families we care about. But the point is, Yahweh never created this creation to be permanent. And when he cast the devil down here, he knew that it was going to culminate into, a, as time went on, greater and greater aspect of living in hell, literally. That's what we've got going on here. The whole world lies in wickedness. We're living amongst demonic spirits that are incarnated in the hearts and minds of men. And Yahweh has to come in to destroy it. That's just the way it's got to be. Let's go over to that uh, book of Jude for a minute, because there's a couple of verses that are coming to my mind that I think uh, would behoove us to read. Let me see where that is here. Oh, I pulled the wrong one. I pulled the wrong one. I'm sorry. Let me go back again. Uh, let's see here. There it is. It's right next to Revelation. And there's only one chapter in there. So I want you to go down to... Well, let's see here. All right. Let's start at 3. Jude, verse 3. Okay. Love. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needed, needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the sons. Now that's one of our aims. Mm -hmm. And he's telling them to contend. Contend means you're going to have to fight for it. It's going to be a fight, and Dr. Kinley used to say, it's going to be a fight to the finish, ladies and gentlemen. And every one of us daily are fighting with the mystery of iniquity. Whether you've recognized it or not, Yahshua in you is fighting against that devil who's trying to get you to doubt, trying to get you to turn your back on this, for you not to come down to these lectures, 
to find more important things to do with your time than hearing the gospel preached. He'll do everything in his power to stop you from filling up with that spiritual oil. That's his job. See, to destroy your soul. And your soul can only be preserved through faith in Yahshua the Messiah and to be rooted in the gospel of salvation. And he's trying to stop that process. Now, Yahshua told them that as soon as the good man cast seed into his field, the wicked came immediately to snatch away that which was sown. Now, when you come up and you're sitting in these classes and the gospel is being preached and these words of salvation are being brought to your ears and to your attention, the devil is right there to try to distract you, to not listen to it, don't pay attention to it, don't think about it, don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. So we can be in these classes, go into classes, and be sound asleep, ladies and gentlemen. And that happens to all of us. And that, that's part of our scripture reading. Because he, taught, he said that the bridegroom tarrieth, and while we all slept. Now falling asleep spiritually means you're just not keeping your mind on the things of Yahweh. And all of us have that happen to us. It's not something that just happens to so-called those that don't have any oil, it happens to the ones that have the oil too. But the difference is they've got that oil packed away so that when they're awoken, they can use that oil to light their lamps. That's the important thing. Now, keep reading in Jude, because I haven't gotten down to yet what I want to point out to you. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They were ordained. They were ordained to this condemnation. They were set up to do this. That were that you know this was the mystery of iniquity was ordained right from the angelic creation to deceive those angels that he's deceived, that third, and to come on down and try to do the same thing to every human, every soul in this physical creation. Keep reading. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our, our Elohim into lasciviousness and denying the only Yahshua the Messiah. That's right. Read. And Yahweh. I will right. therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that Yahshua, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now, right there, it's not enough for you to be brought out of the world and down here and acquire just information. That is correct. I mean, you could go out and tell anybody his name was not Jesus because there's no J in Hebrew. Now, that is part of the process that we all have to go through on our journey. But that's not the end. Something has to take root in the soul that causes you to be awakened to the reality that Yahweh is real that and be ever present, uh, ever conscious of his presence. And so that has to happen. That's part of the what, what this class does. We first introduce you to the information. And then you, in your mind, reason out as you hear it, gee, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, there was no J in Hebrew. His name couldn't have been Jesus. But now there's another step that has to take place after that. As one dean once said, what you learn in your brain or your head has to make a migration. He called it a 10-inch migration from the brain down to the heart. Because belief, the belief is vitally necessary, and that belief is a matter of the heart, ladies and gentlemen, because Paul talks about, in Romans the 10th chapter, that if we confess Yahshua with our mouth and believe in our heart, we will be saved. So belief has to go right to the heart, the core of your soul, so that you, if you believe it, you're going to walk the walk, as they say. You're going to live it. Keep reading. Six. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation... 
He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now listen, when he talks about that verse we just read up above it, that he saved the people out of the land of Egypt and afterward destroyed them because they didn't believe. Now Yahweh showed them all those witnesses with the ten plagues, with them being spared from the plague of death, of the by the death angel going over their houses, getting to the Red Sea for crying out loud, and then being delivered by the parting of a sea. And yet they still went to Mount Sinai out of fear. They agreed to keep the covenant that Yahweh gave and then turned around when Moses sent 12 spies up into the land of Canaan. This was during the first part of their 40-year tenure. Because before this happens, there wasn't a 40-year tenure, but it ended up to be that. Now, what I want you to know is he sent those spies up there. And when they came back, 10 of the spies said there's giants up there. We can't take them. We're, we can't go up there and possess that land. And Joshua, or Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb told Moses, let us talk to the people, because they were two spies also. They were witnesses. And they said, listen, Yahweh will fight for us. He will be with us. Now listen, for you to take that admonition that Joshua gave or Joshua gave to the people would require you to believe Yahweh keeps his word. It would require you to believe that Yahweh, he promised you that land and nothing is going to prevent you from possessing it. He was imploring them, first of all, to let go of the fear and to believe in their creator and his promises. It's not, they knew that there was a creator. He was up on top of that mountain speaking to him and he shook the earth. There was no question that they believed in God. The problem is they didn't believe what Yahweh promised, what he said he was going to do. And therefore, those people, when they heard Joshua or Yahshua, the son of Nun, it's over in Numbers, and Caleb give the true report, they all said, stone them. They wanted to kill Yahshua and Caleb. Now that's when Yahweh Elohim stepped in and told Moses, stand aside and I will destroy these people. And he said, no, 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 don't do that. They'll say that you brought them out here just to kill them. And yet he said, I swear that their carcasses shall fall and not one of them shall go into the inheritance. And he dropped every one of those people that didn't believe the true report there in the wilderness. And one day, for every one year for every day that they spied out the land, they spied the land for 40 days. Therefore, Yahweh gave them a 40-year sentence. And during that 40 years, what he did is, as they were dying off, they were having children, and the second generation, or those were the second born, would become the inheritors of that land of Canaan. So it's not enough for you to know the name Yahweh. They knew the name Yahweh, these people. Not enough for you to see these miraculous things Yahweh did. They had to be born again, ladies and gentlemen. They had to have more than that. They had to have, and this is typified. I'm, I'm talking about those second-born generation were a figure of those that are born after the Spirit. And once that second generation is born in, who knew not, the land of Egypt, they agreed with, without hesitation to go up and fight for that land, showing that the secondborn is going to get the inheritance, not the firstborn. Now, every one of us have to believe in the promise that Yahweh is going to take us out of this, 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 this creation and he's going to give us in a mortal glorified body and bring us into our own land to dwell in Yahshua, which is the uh, in the new heaven and new earth state that is glorious beyond our wildest imaginations, that is a land full of peace, full of love and joy, everlasting joy and peace and righteousness. Who wouldn't want to who wouldn't want to be in that state? And listen, you have to be willing to give up everything to inherit it. You have to be willing to give up yourself and give up your will in order for you to become 
a recipient of the inheritance. And listen, you can't do that of yourself. You need Yahshua. You need Yahshua to give you a heart to love him, and you need Yahshua to cause you to believe, to give you a revelation to believe in him and to believe in the Father. And you need him to change you, to cause you to be born again or to go through a change, to be born from above, to become a new creature. And listen, this life that we're living in, we are analogous to those caterpillars that go into the chrysalis and then are born again. They are changed. They are converted. And we call it uh, metamorphosis. Now, we have to go through that conversion process in our heart and mind. Our hearts are hard when we walk in the door. Our will is most important to us that we get what we want. And what Yahshua has to do is cause us to know that Yahweh keeps his word. He's a keeper of promises. And that Yahweh can be depended upon. That you can trust him with your very life. You can trust him to do what is best for you. And you can believe that Yahweh will provide, even when things seem difficult and hard for you to imagine, you're in a bad situation, how am I going get, to get out of this one? He has a way of escape, ladies and gentlemen. He has a way of delivery. If you can do this, as Moses told the people when they were at the Red Sea, when they doubted that they would live any further than that because they said, we can't get away from the Egyptians or right behind us, and there's a sea in front of us. And what Moses told them was to stand still or to be still. In other words, quiet down inside yourself and watch the salvation that Yahweh will show you this day. Yahweh loves to reveal his salvation to you when you are in a state of no way to deliver your own self, a state of panic, and he can quiet you down and then show you things that will cause you to do nothing more to praise him and give all the glory to him and honor that he saved you. And we have to have these same things take place in our everyday life in order for us to be accustomed to how he's always got our back. But when it comes to your soul salvation, you have to believe as much as you think I'm not perfect, as much as you think I don't know everything, you have to believe what Paul said over in Philippians, the first chapter. He said, he that has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the end. It's Yahshua in us that's performing a good work. He is converting us. He is causing us to become a new creature. He is changing us right to the core of our soul. And you're not the same as you were when you first walked in. And as you grow in this understanding, the more changes take place in you. And we often wonder, well, how, how much change do I have to have to be acceptable to Yahshua, which was in our scripture tonight, we'll hopefully get to that too, uh, to be acceptable to Yahshua, to receive, a, be a partaker of the inheritance. Guess what? He knows exactly how much is necessary to get you to be accepted by the Father that you might go into the new heaven and new earth state. As I once asked Dr. Kinley this question, I said, Dr. Kinley, do we have to be perfect before the end of the age in order to be saved and go on into the new heaven and new earth state? And this is what he said. He said, you will not be perfect while you're in a physical body in the flesh. He said, it's not till you receive that immortal glorified body that you'll be perfect. He said, however, you are perfect for the state and condition for which you are in. And to put it in the words of Paul, you are perfect for the measure of grace that has been given unto you. And he knows how much measure of grace is necessary for you to remain faithful and to be able to present you before the presence of Yahweh so that you are acceptable. That is his job 
to dispense the grace, the dispensation of grace that we're in now, is under the fourth age. And grace, ladies and gentlemen, which means unmerited reward, and also by uh, implication so that you understand this, every revelation that Yahshua gives us is a measure of grace. Because revelations, when Yahweh opens up to your understanding, the spiritual reality of what things you are hearing in class and it becomes real to you is what causes changes to take place in you and causes you to become more and more perfect in the divine nature. And it's by grace that we're saved and not of ourselves. And so what I'm saying to you is we're in a fight and it's going to be a fight to the finish. And we're headed towards the final line. Uh, Pull up for a minute, if you wouldn't mind for me, the ages and dispensation chart, please. Now we see that we're down here. Can you blow that up a little bit? We see they're down here in this fourth age. Now in 1975, Dr. Kinley instructed us that up there at the top where it says fourth age, present kingdom age, that he wanted us to put in there present kingdom age of grace. He wanted grace brought out and mentioned in this fourth age. Now, I know that dispensations uh, uh, on there, uh, some of us uh, have a hard time understanding exactly the operation of dispensation. The fifth and sixth age, the, the, it says New Testament or Old Covenant, uh, or New Covenant, excuse me, not Old Covenant, or New Covenant. Now, what I want you to understand is the New Covenant is that Yahweh is going to call, call us from amongst the heathen and bring us into our own land, which means bring us into the body of Yahshua the Messiah. Now, you are in the body of Yahshua now, by the way. I'm not talking about just at the end of the age. Paul says he hath translated us. This is in Colossians, the first chapter. Then he translated us into the kingdom. We're all not going to be translated. We are translated into the kingdom. We are in Yahshua now. Now, we are not perfected yet. That's going on as he finishes the work he's doing in each of us. But we will be perfect at the end of this age when he presents us before the presence of his glory, as we say in our doxology at every class. And I want you to know this, that this dispensation, one of the ways you can apply this, I'm not saying it's the only way, that dispensation by definition means the dispensing. That's one of the usages of the term dispensation. Now we are, we had on the day of Pentecost the dispensing of the Holy Spirit upon mankind. Yahweh poured out his spirit on all flesh. But along with that pouring out of the spirit, which is the new covenant, is the dispensing of grace to those that are recipients that receive that spirit and become recipients of the process by which we will grow to perfection. He is by giving us revelation and opening up more and more to our understanding and strengthening us in our inner man. Now we read over there in, in uh, Romans the fifth chapter that he loved us when we were yet without strength. There was a scripture read in one of our classes, I don't know if it was Saturday night or last night, where he talks about being strengthened in the inner man. Now the strength that all of us need is the strength of conviction uh, by the Holy Spirit of the reality of this teaching and why it is worth you selling everything that you have to obtain this pearl of great price. And for you to really take this serious and make this class really the center of your life, the core of your soul, it defines you. Now, this dispensation of grace is vitally important because this is where Yahweh is revealing to us his great kindness and mercy of by giving us unmerited reward, a gift. Now, I asked Dr. Kinley this question. I said, Doc, what are we going to go on to learn in the ages after this one? He said, we will go on to learn of Yahweh's love and his kindness towards his creatures. So I want you to know that grace is the manifestation or demonstration by Yahweh of his love and kindness towards you and me. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't do anything to earn it, but he just out of the out of the 
wonderful kindness and love that defines Yahweh's divine nature decided to give us his spirit and to open up to us the mysteries of his great purpose and plan that has come on down right from the beginning down to the end. And so all of this, all of this is preparatory in this age to get you to that line that is separating the fifth and sixth age where it says revelation of Yahshua the Messiah from heaven. Well, on one chart it said from heaven, but it is from heaven. They think that Yahshua is going to come back into the earth plane and walk around on the earth. What they don't realize is that when Yahshua appears, the earth and the creation are going to melt away, as Peter says over there in 2 Peter, the third chapter, that the elements will melt with fervent heat, that the earth is going to be gone, it's going to be burned up. So Yahshua is not coming back into the earth plane. Yahshua was going to reveal himself from heaven, and Dr. Kindler used to say it like this. He said that, that Yahshua, when he appears at the close of this age, will appear in all of his glory, and he will outshine the noonday sun. He will be brighter than any star anywhere in the universe, any quasar, whatever you name it. And that that fervent heat that will destroy the universe is Yahshua's own spiritual, if you will, spiritual body that will cause the creation to be dissolved. Now, Yahshua spoke this creation in. And in, in Genesis, the first chapter, when he said, let there be light, that was Yahshua speaking to Moses back then, but it, he was not known as Yahshua then. He was known as Elohim which isn't a name, but it's a divine title. And he spoke in every aspect. He said, let there be light, let the waters above separate from the waters beneath, let there be the fish in the sea and the birds in the air. Everything was spoken in. Now, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Just like in the beginning, and the end is declared from the beginning, he spoke in the physical creation. Now, down here in this age, which is after the, the veil of the flesh has been removed, which was removed when Yahshua raised from that tomb, that veil was rent in twain, and for our intent purposes, when we were circumcised of the carnal mind is on the day of Pentecost, when the physical mind, the physical thinking, would be translated to another state, a higher plane of consciousness. And he told them to go out and preach the gospel. He said, Go ye therefore in all nations, teaching them, and, and baptizing them, immersing them in the name of Yahweh and the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Those are the names that we are immersing the world in now. Now listen, as we start to express these spiritual realities and principles, don't you see that we go back to the manifestations to witness to those things that are in the Law and the Prophets? But as we speak in the new spiritual understanding and revelation, we are taking the physical out of existence. Now, what do I mean by that? Yes, the physical is still here. But I mean we no longer now need water baptism. We no longer need to have crackers and grape juice or a, a Passover supper or any of the other things that people were doing in the flesh. We are speaking into you. Just as Yahshua spoke in the creation, it's the Holy Spirit preaching the gospel right from these vessels that is speaking the new creature into your heart and mind. He's bringing in the new creation by his spoken word because he brought the physical creation in also by his spoken word. And that's how he's taking it out. And now the more revelation you have, the more the flesh becomes to you not the reality, but Yahweh, the ever-present conscious awareness that Yahweh is real, and recognizing his spirit and operation in our everyday life and in the world, we now have our sights focused on that spirit. We are now, ladies and gentlemen, transcending that state and becoming a new creature, and we are lifted up now into a heavenly place. And Paul said to them over there that our conversation is in heaven. 
And when we come to class and we're caught up in the spirit, that is the holy thing. And people have given these lectures, Dr. Kinley gave it. And I, I remember Dr. Fred Allen also gave the same lecture because he was there when Dr. Kinley gave it, when Doc said, I heard a voice from heaven. Now, when you're sitting down in these classes, whether it be on Zoom or you're in a classroom and something is said, and it's not Dennis Volpe's voice or Steve Gagno's voice or, or, or anybody else that you might think is uh, somebody that's one of your spiritual leaders. When you hear Yahshua's voice coming out of a vessel, you will be caught up to a state where all of a sudden the spiritual reality is more real to you than the physical. And that is taking you past the veil of the flesh and speaking in the new creation right within you. At the end of this age, when he takes down the veil, that is to say the whole physical universe is going to be brought down, those that have the spiritual reality now, it's going to be manifested for every eye to see, those that have had that spiritual new creature formed in them. And they will come out in glory. Now, the example is the metamorphosis of a caterpillar. That caterpillar goes in there, and it's not exactly a, a, a gorgeous creature when it's a caterpillar. But when it makes the change in that chrysalis, and it comes forth out of that, uh, yeah, out of that, uh, we're getting it over on the green chart, I think we're looking for it right now. Now, right there, if you could blow that up. That, that butterfly, the adult there that you see, we call it, this, this happens to be a monarch butterfly, which means king. Now, it starts out as an egg, and it comes through the state of a larva, and then eventually into a, 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 you know, a caterpillar, a pupa, and then it goes into the chrysalis or the cocoon there. And what's happening is there are uh, hormones that are within the, the, the caterpillar that begin the process to awaken imaginal cells or imaginal disc that actually consume the flesh of the caterpillar and emerges then the true form of the species is the butterfly, not the caterpillar. Caterpillar is a temporary state. Now that butterfly, when it comes out with all of its beauty, its wings, it is a very gentle creature. You never heard of anybody getting stung by a butterfly. The butterfly, you'll let it fly on your hand. People have amassed these wonderful butterfly uh, collections where these various types of butterfly and all their beauty uh, to show these collections. I know somebody that had one of those, actually. But they also do not reproduce in that state of the caterpillar. Reproduction is done once they're in the state of the butterfly to show that they cannot increase as a caterpillar. They have to go through a change in order to be able to increase. And David was talking about the increase. And so therefore, Yahweh has showed us, in, and listen, that butterfly is no longer an earthbound creature, which the caterpillar was. It crawled across the ground. Its only purpose is to eat. Eat, eat, eat. Now, when it comes out of the, uh, the, the cocoon and becomes that butterfly, it is a heavenly creature because now it flies, it soars, and it draws nectar from those uh, flowers that you see. And the word nectar in the definition in Strong, not Strong's, but in, in uh, Merriam-Webster is food of the gods. And they have shown that these butterflies, they, they go to the place a place down in uh, 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 Mexico, and they make a long migration. And what they're doing is they're reproducing. And what they do to have energy, they have a, some kind of a, 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 a substance on their wings that they can stop and perch the wings towards the sun, and they become solar-powered. have an article that shows that. They become powered by the sun. Everything about that butterfly that we're, I'm telling you is a manifestation of what you are going to go through as you're going through your changes. And this class, the preaching of the gospel is necessary for each of us to have some old part of us, as it were, spoken out and a new part to emerge. And we are becoming more and more a representation of of the divine nature, the more we learn, the more revelation Yahshua gives us. Now, 
let's go back over our scripture because I only got 10 minutes left and I want to get back down. I'm going to cut through because we know what happened, that the five wise went out with their lights and the five foolish asked them because they realized we don't have any, we don't have any oil. So they wanted to buy oil from the ones that had it and the ones that had it said, look, I'm not, I got to make sure I got enough for myself. I can't sell you my oil. So go and buy where the oil is sold. So where was the oil sold? Well, the oil is back there in the Law and the Prophets, ladies and gentlemen. Now think about this for a minute. Do you know that when we pump oil out of the earth, that oil is deep down most of the times in the earth, and it is the remains of once living plants and possibly animals too that is turned into oil. That oil now is down in the earth, and they go out drilling to find an oil well. And that oil started out by being plants that have de decayed and so on. Now, and, and what I want you to know is we go back over into the Law and the Prophets. That's like the earth or the foundation. And we drill down into these stories now, and we tap into principles that are contained in these stories that become a gusher. Sometimes somebody breaks into something and all of a sudden, all these different principles start to come forth and emerge that cause other people to be stimulated and to work with other aspects of it. And it powers us to preach the gospel and to encourage the rest of the brethren. So we're tapping into the oil that Yahweh has laid under the surface. And so the manifestation is the surface, but the oil is the spiritual principle that is underneath the surface. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that oil. And so we have, th those of us that have remained steadfast and coming to class to learn, and I'm talking about acquiring some of this spiritual principles in your heart and mind, you are hanging on to those, and you're not going to let those things go because those are the very things that will give you when you have fallen asleep, slumbered and slept, as it says. That's what's going to power you up again to go right back to that spiritual thing that Yahweh is now revealing to us down here at the end of the age. Some people, when they run out of that, they don't have that oil, they don't have any energy. They don't have any zeal for the gospel. They don't really have any dedication to it. And unfortunately, just having information isn't going to save your soul. You have to have the essence of this going on inside of you, and only Yahshua can do that. When I say you got to do it, really, there's nothing you do. He just reveals it to you and opens it up. And this is what it's going to take to keep us charged up so that when the bridegroom appears, we're waiting and ready. And we are willing to, to be patient for him to reveal himself, because we don't want, as, as uh, one of the speakers said last night, we don't want this thing to go out till that last soul that Yahweh has foreordained unto salvation is saved. We don't want any lost. And Yahshua said, none will be lost. Over there in 17th chapter of John. So now I want you to go down to the 25th again and talk about well, somebody got into the talents and talked about the increase. I think David did that as well. But I want to go down when Yahshua comes with his mighty angels. If anybody knows where that's in the 25th chapter. It's after the talents. 31. Okay. 31. Yes. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now listen, this is talking about the end of the age. Yahshua right now is in the angelic creation. When he tears out this veil, then we will see him sitting on his throne with his mighty angels. 
So people are thinking we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. They think Jesus is going to come back in the earth because they interpret things and think that it means he's going to set up another kingdom here. He's going to make the Christians the uh, ones that rule and all these kinds. And it's not what it's about, lady. Those are all type shadows, allegories that you have to get to the reality of it. Yahshua came to bring us into an everlasting state, which is the new heaven and new earth state. And that he's going to glorify us with his own self, that we're going to come forth. And it was talked about last night uh, in the Green Bay class, how that Yahshua is going to, we're all going to appear with him in glory at the end of this age. We're going to, and as Dr. Kinley put it like this, he said, when Yahshua appears and he outshines the noonday sun, he said he will appear as a super incorporeal being. And you're going to be right there with him with the same body that he has. And those that have not, that have not received the gospel, that have not, as it were, adhered to it, or, or that is to say, uh, valued it, are not going to have that superincorporeal body, and they're going to realize what they have missed by rejecting the truth. That, and I'll tell you this, you don't, Dr. Kinley was adamant that if you come into this class and you hear the gospel preached, and even if you walk out, never come back again, he said, you'll never be the same. And the reason why you'll never be the same is because you will suffer greater than people who have never heard this before at the end of this age, if you reject the truth when it was made available to you. And the catch-22 Yahshua has to cause you to be able to receive it or you will reject it. Now, keep reading. Verse 41 is on the left hand. What he what you're reading in 31 is what five minutes, reward. okay. All right. So should I keep reading at 32? Go ahead. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, you know the sheep and the goats were all hanging out together before the separation. And the sheep are on the right hand, because I don't have time to have you read it all, and the goats are on the left hand. Now the thing about a goat is that a goat usually will eat anything. Goats are those that come to class and whatever they hear, they, they swallow it right up. They don't discern the difference between what's right and wrong. And the sheep are those that follow their shepherd. That is to say, Yahshua the Messiah, the Holy Spirit. And they're docile animals. And they are absolutely uh, uh, dependent upon the shepherd. They can do nothing of themselves. They need the shepherd to survive. And so he's telling the sheep to come into those souls that are likened unto the sheep. He said, come ye into the kingdom that was prepared for you. Could you get that for me and read it? Thirty-four. Okay. 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now it was prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Meaning that Yahweh had prepared you or chosen you right from the beginning and that you will be going into the inheritance, understanding that Yahweh is salvation through grace and mercy. Even though the end is declared from the beginning, and Yahweh already purposed for those souls that are going to be saved in Yahshua the Messiah, they must go through the process of actually being saved. They have to be devoid of the Holy Spirit. They have to be put in captivity to the mystery of iniquity and then brought out by Yahweh from that state. Just as the Israelites were put into captivity to Pharaoh and they were the chosen people and then Yahweh came down to deliver them 
and then they had to be born again in the wilderness, as I've already explained, and then they were brought back to the land that was theirs from the beginning. Now that land that we call Canaan is figurative of you dwelling in Yahshua the Messiah. Dr. Kinley talked about how that Abraham walked the length and the breadth of Canaan's land and never once set foot in the promised land. Now the promised land is them dwelling in Yahshua because before Pentecost, they did not dwell in Yahshua. They had the Holy Spirit manifested in them and it was veiled no revelation to them that that was Yahshua in them because it was temporary. And they had to wait for redemption before Yahshua then gathered them unto himself and brought them under the new covenant. And then they were also then the ones that were also prepared from the foundation of the world to come into the new heaven and new earth, to the new kingdom, and receive the inheritance. So all I'm going to say in conclusion, because we're out of time, is that this purpose is a wonderful purpose, and if you can you can grab a hold of it, and don't let anybody take it away from you. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear and try to get you to walk away from this or to deny it or anything of that nature. Do all that you can to be obedient and come to class. I hope you got something out of that. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll turn it back to the moderator. Peace in Yahshua. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. We hold Zoom classes every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We hope you will join us again. Please remain muted until the live stream has completed. We will now be dismissed by the doxology taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy. To the only wise Yahweh, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.